Jonathan, I'll start with you. So the affidavit has really revealed some that one of the surviving roommates explained to police that she opened her door several times after hearing someone crying. She saw a figure in black with a mask walking towards her and then going out the sliding door. Um, what do you make of this and the fact that a call to 911 wasn't made until hours later? Well, I know it sounds very odd that this occurred, but uh, you actually see this as quite common with people who are startled at night and uh, people will freeze in their sleep and they'll have vast amounts of time that will go by and they don't even realize what's occurred. I think uh, the fact that she stepped out, um, this predator in the midst of killing was uh, startled and that's why he left. She could have been the next victim had he not been startled, because for a predator, it's a lot different when they're actually carrying out their attack than when they have to actually turn and face somebody um, that is uh, that has discovered them. So I think that's what occurred. And although it sounds very odd, and it is a lot of times the way human beings react to fear, uh, I don't think that there's anything um, it's that suspicious in, in this. Yeah, and, you know, police say that they were out partying, so she could have been drinking. So there's a lot of things that play into Most that. Uh, I agree. Joe, the white Hyundai Elantra seemed to be a big piece of information connecting Kohlberger to the murder. So his license plate matched the description from one of the roommates. But uh, something that's a big red herring here is that the affidavit notes, so his cell phone didn't ping in the area at the time of the murder. So a lot of people saying maybe he just turned it off when he committed the murders. Uh, what do you make? Make, and do, do you think that he has any sort of defense here? Look, I mean, we know what's in the affidavit from from law enforcement. We don't know what he has to say or, or what. Um, I will tell you, as a former prosecutor, this looks like a very, very strong case. I mean, it looks like a case that, you know, you have DNA evidence linking him to the crime scene. You have the vehicle, which was captured on video at the time of the murders, his vehicle, um, and subsequently returning to um, Washington State University at approximately, you know, the same time after the murders were committed uh, within, within you know, an hour. Um, you have other evidence that seems just so powerful, aside from the eyewitness testimony. Um, so I, I think, you know, and also the cell phone evidence, there is evidence that his cell phone pinged near the murder house at least a dozen times in the months before the massacre. So it puts him in that area. So it yeah. looks like he was stalking his prey. Mm -hmm. um, this evidence was very overwhelming and powerful. But look, at the end of the day, you have DNA. And DNA's puts him at the crime scene. And, and to me, that's game, set, and match. Yeah, and there's also video surveillance of him returning to the crime scene in that car um, early in the morning. Uh, Jonathan, a knife sheath was left at the crime scene, allowing law enforcement to get that DNA. Uh, they recovered it from the garage of his parents' home. Based on what we know about this so far, do you think uh, that Koberger may have done this before? Perhaps he has committed murder before? I think when we look at uh, the history that he that's been reported about him at a uh, brewery, uh, the uh, Seven Sirens Brewery in Pennsylvania, I think what we see is that he at least has a history of stalking women. The questions he was asking there is asking women if they lived alone, and he was very aggressive. And then when he was confronted by the manager, he denied it, and then he never came back. So we see the same type of cat and mouse game from before he got to Washington State. He just got to Washington State in August. So when we look at this uh, pattern of behavior, um, I think it, it does lead to some. I think it's very possible that he killed before. What is very interesting, I'd love to hear what Joe has to say about this, is that uh, I know what the defense is gonna hone in on, which is the fact that the video shows him only being at the house for about 15 minutes. And people are going to say, man, you can't kill this many people in 15 minutes like this. But I think it is possible. And I think he would have stayed there longer uh, had he not been discovered by this other girl. And I think that that cut it short. And then he he left. And I also think that when he attacked the uh, the people on the second floor, um, I don't think that he was able to completely uh, terminate their life. Mm -hmm. I think he had to get out of there and they probably died uh, from bleeding yeah. out. A good point. Uh, Joe, we have about 15 seconds. Just want to get your response mm -hmm. to what Jonathan said. Yeah, I, I agree. Look, 15 minutes is more than enough time to bludge four people with a knife and get out. And as a matter of fact, the car, you know, puts him at that scene right before the murders 
and, and right after the murder. So I, I think this is a pretty airtight case. Allison. Yeah, and we'll see if they go for the death penalty because the death penalty is in Idaho. All right, Joe Tacopina, Jonathan Gilliam, thank you so much for your insight, gentlemen. Appreciate it.